and we had the tropo in, descri in describing the line of sight and the repeaters and that. The issue with that one is to make it simple for you is just we have those C's and D's. Make sure that you pull them out and look at them because on Monday we should be going over the signal flow diagram and they're on there. So pull up your electronic C's and D's sometime this weekend. Look through it casually. You don't have to, you know, get down and dirty with it unless you feel like it. Uh, that will help the job of you trying to figure out what's going on when we bring it up for signal flow. Here my headphones are up. So we're going to look at uh, tropo theory, and as always, tell you about the 70% that's getting 28 out of 40. The AFSC application, you're going to have to apply that when you're dealing with this, what I call, over-the-horizon scenarios. Not to be confused with beyond line of sight. Beyond line of sight is for what I call long-haul communications. In other words, farther than 600 miles. With HF and with SATCOM, you can go many miles beyond that. So we're going to look at tropospheric communications, antenna terms, and tropospheric antennas. So this is going to be relatively quick, and then we're going to go through the tech order, and we are done for the day. Hopefully it will be less than an hour. <laughs> I know this morning session uh, with my boss sitting in, I don't know what the, you know, why he was in there, but it turned out a little bit longer than I cared for. Normally it's like an hour and a half session. Just uh, was a little elongated for some reason. No, it's fine. We all survived. Yes, sir. I think you were very informative, so it's yeah. fine, sir. I try to uh, explain it a little bit more than what, you know, I try to give you that extra stuff to get you through, oh, wow, this is where it applies. And if I can get you to understand where it applies, then you'll have some type of interest in it. At least that's my theory. So we look at tropospheric communication antenna terms, tropospheric antennas. Let's look at tropo. Now they say beyond line of sight. It is if you want to look at it that way, but it's, there is extreme limitations. The biggest thing is instead of it bouncing off the troposphere, like you think of uh, reflecting, it actually refracts back down. The problem is, is you really got to saturate the upper part of the tropo in order for it to refract down to Earth. Most of that information goes right through the outer space. Now, if you really get into it and start studying the, what do they call that, uh, Earth science, uh, you'll find out that there's convergent zones between the tropo and the stratus. Well, that's where most of the tropo refraction happens is in that little area. Again, it's very minute, but the idea is you're going to have some very, you know, super de duper de gain antennas in order for it to receive it. And of course, you're going to have some, a lot of wattage on the other hand to saturate that tropo to get it to refract back down. This little conversion zone we call the common volume or scatter volume area where it refracts back down to Earth. This gives you an idea you know, visually of what's happening. But again, it's all about how much that you're shipping out and how much is actually being refracted back down and the gain of the antennas. Just look at the power. 300 to 50,000 watts from about 350 megahertz to 8 gigahertz. The numbers there are subject for review. If you looked it up on 
any credible website, you will see anywhere between 580 to 610 miles. I do not know why they picked 595. It might have been the reference. And this is mainly for fixed. Um, when you get into the tactical world, like the front picture was when we looked at uh, 4 Alpha, then that is a tactical one. And you're looking maybe maximum of 300 watts because the last thing you want is you to become the target. Because our enemy is actually looking at us trying to find out where our comm is so, we, so they can take out our eyes, so to speak. We have scatter volume. Again, that's that little area, scatter volume or common volume, where it gets refracted back down to earth. They call it the area where both antennas can, one can send, the other receive, and vice versa. Again, it relies on the gain of the antenna. There are four types of diversity systems and they compensate for something called blurring. Blurring being when things interfere with each other. The first one is polarization. You're going to find out with the tisser that when you set up two, you know, I got the one end versus the other end. You're going to find out that when you are given that cut sheet, if you put both of those together at both sites, you know, come together and take a look at it, you'll notice that one antenna says horizontally polarized, the other one says vertically polarized. Now why is that? You know, you've been taught back in block four that you can't talk to each other when one is out of, you know, non, those are linear polarization. You can't talk from a vertical to a horizontal and a horizontal to a vertical. Well, there's a reason for that. The first reason, well, the, actually the only reason, is when you look at the tisser, you don't want your transmits to interfere with each other. That's the first part. I want to go down to where it says frequency down there. You will find out that a, one transmit frequency is different than the other transmit frequency. There you go. Well, the polarization is going to be different, and same with the frequency. Your frequency should be 200 megahertz from transmit to receive. That is a minimum. It should be more. So not only do you have polarization diversity between the transmitting antennas, but you also have frequency diversity because both of them are going to be different. Now you're going to take a look at this and go, well, gee, my transmit frequency is the same as their receive frequency. And their transmit frequency is the same as my receive frequency. Well, remember, this is a full duplex system. You got to transmit and receive at the same time. The way that they make this happen is if you were to look at one of the tissers and take a look at the where you got to put the waveguide on you will notice that one of those might have the plastic piece taken off and you can see the antenna inside the antenna inside the tisser is probably I want to say about an eighth of an inch long but the one thing that really makes things happen is because if you look at the way the antenna is set up it's not vertical it's not horizontal it's at a 45 degree angle you guys remember about the nivis and how it propagates at the top end is the horizontally polarized section and at the bottom end is the vertically polarized section there you go it's when you are receiving that it will not matter whether the transmit end is either vertical or horizontal. And that's how you're able to talk to each other. It's because of the way the antenna is oriented so you can make those things happen. The waveguide determines the polarization 
on the transmit end. It is truly amazing how they made this happen. The other two, which is angle and space, the angle portion means how you're tilting that antenna. You got your azimuthal, which is 360 degrees, basically the circle, and elevation up and down. And the way you set that is there may be a difference of your scatter angle versus the other one. And that's when you're pretty far apart. When it comes to the space, you know, now you got to start taking a look at the equipment. Now with our tisser, the farther apart you get, the better response you're going to have. If you set them up inside in the hallway, like I think that they're doing because it's getting kind of warm outside, or if it's raining, the biggest problem that you have is you can actually point the antennas in opposite direction and still be able to talk to each other. That's because there's so much back radiation from it, it'll work like that. Also, the hallway acts like a big waveguide. Yep. And you're saturating the front end to where you can't really, you know, there's no differentiation between where it is. You go outside, if you were to get about a mile apart, that's when you start seeing the, oh, my RSL is pretty low. Maybe I need to tweak this dish a little bit. But when you're inside like we're doing, or you're probably going to do on Monday, no, wait a minute, Monday. You guys, it won't be until Tuesday, right? Right? When you're doing your lab for Tisser? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so Tuesday. Then you'll find out whether or not you're going to be inside or outside. Of course, another picture showing you the common volume, scatter angle, and so forth and so on. Now we come into... Terms. Now, this one you've seen before, reciprocity. This one is basically using the transmit and antenna. It's going to receive and transmit well. Directivity and gain, higher directivity, higher the gain. Lower directivity, lower the gain. In other words, you're going to compare apples to oranges here in a certain way. If I have a parabolic dish, <laughs> that's pretty high gain. If I have a whip antenna, that's pretty low gain. So you can get the idea. Omnidirectional versus unidirectional. We have frequency. Now you guys have done the mathematical equation for frequency, which shows you, well, gee, the higher the frequency, the smaller the antenna should be because of the wavelength. The lower the frequency, it's the larger the antenna. That's the reason why I tell you that when you are able to look past that little plastic piece, because there's one of those tissers in there that has no plastic piece over the covering, you can actually see that antenna. And it's you know pretty doggone small. Looks like uh, probably the tip of a ballpoint pen would be a way to describe it. That's incredible. Yeah, well, think about it. You're up there in the gigahertz, so let's look at wavelength. Wavelength at, uh, let's say, 3 megahertz is 100 meters. As you start working up, 300 megahertz is what, uh, 1 meter? 1 meter being um, a little over a yard, and now you've got... Uh, that particular, when you get up into the uh, 300 to 3 gig, 3 gigs around 0.1 meter. And then when over 3 gig to 30 gig, now you're looking at 0 0.01 meter. So you're going to get very small. And with the Tisser, it's from 14.4 to 15.25 gigahertz. So you're, you're up there in that small antenna size. Well, think about your cell phone. Where's the antennas on your cell phone? Inside of them. Yeah, inside of them. How big's the antenna? 
I have no clue. Okay, well, well, let's think about it. Most of your cell phones are in that 750 megahertz all the way to 1.5 uh, gigahertz. So most of those cell phones, sometimes the antenna will wrap around the circuit card or maybe even be smaller than that. I've seen some where they talk about what's called a fractal antenna where they use geometric shapes in order for it to receive better and transmit better. Now the output wattage on a cell phone is extremely small, like a quarter of a watt. But back when cell phones came out, we actually had five watt <laughs> cell phones. And those are what we call bag phones. They would come in a bag and you would pick up the, the handset and it would have a long coiled cord on it and, and that's the way you talked you'd flip the antenna up and those were around the 700 megahertz and then the antennas started getting smaller because the frequency started going up but most of your depending on where you're at in the world too also determines what frequency you're going to be on we have two different types of antennas. We have the horn and the parabolic. These are very directional antennas. The idea is I don't want to waste a whole lot of RF power because I want to put it all into the gain of the antenna. The horn antenna, you guys have gone over back in block four, pretty much the same thing. They are the simplest type. You have a yaggy antenna, so to speak, which is a unidirectional. And then, of course, the impedance mashing that's on it. We have the parabolic. You guys have seen that when you come up to Jones Hall. There's a bunch of those SATCOM dishes out in that gated area. You're going to be dealing with the parabolic dish when it comes time to use the tisser. And we have two different sizes for it. You have types of these feeds which are front feed and rear feed now I let me uh, go back to this one part I just now noticed size and gain are directly proportional let me explain that remember now you're dealing with the upper frequency range so your antenna is going to be really small when they say size and gain are directly proportional they're talking about how to get that information to hit that antenna. So if you have a small dish and you compare it to a big dish, you went from a low gain antenna to a high gain antenna. So the bigger the dish, the more gain that you're going to do. In other words, all that ref Let's say you're receiving all that energy is going to hit that dish and we're going to be able to collect it on that antenna and channel it to that antenna. And then if it's transmitting, it's such a huge tight beam that when it transmits out, there you go. So you have both, you have reciprocity for that. Sir. Yes. Is a, is a dish useful for anything but receiving so it's not useful for transmitting is it it yes it can be used for transmitting that's that's what i'm saying is uh, with parabolic dishes in our wonderful world we have both transmit and receive happening at the same time if you're talking like a satellite dish for direct tv and di and dish network then that's more of a receive type dish when i say receive it depends if you're out in the middle of nowhere and you want internet. And that's where you get to transmit and receive with it. It's a little bit right. more costly. So, yes, that dish has everything to do with the collection and the radiation. So the front and, uh, and rear feed, the first one we look at is the center fed and offset for the front feed and it is the most common type, again the direct TV and the SATCOM that we have out in the gated area. 
The rear feed, we have a cast of green and a cutler. You're going to be dealing with the cutler when you are working with the Jerk 239, better known as the Tisser. The front feed, you can see from this picture, <laughs> it's out front. That's all I can tell you. There's, there's no voodoo science with this. It's all from the front. When you look at offset, this is where, if you walk by that gate, or the gated area, or the fenced-in area next to our building there, you will see a couple of these offset front feeds. And again, they're just enough to where the radiation from the transmit is going to hit that dish perfectly and send it out, and same with it having that receive, everything's going to be collected. When we look at the Cassegrainian, we have one. And if you look at the picture off of the bottom right-hand side, you will see that particular dish when you go by, uh, by our building. This works off of something called a parabolic subreflector. It is a curved piece of metal to where when, if you're transmitting, everything is coming out of the back of the dish, hitting that subreflector, where it just gets it on the outside portions of the dish and it reflects it back into a big cone to send it out. The biggest pro uh, problem with these things is some of these are quite large, especially if you get into the VHS side of the house. Now that's where the antenna is a little bit bigger than our Fisher antenna, which is again the size of a ballpoint pin versus Let's just say, I'm trying to think of the darn satellite dish that I was privy to out in Fort Gordon. That thing was huge, but it was a VHF SATCOM dish. Yeah, hey, I'm from there. Okay, there you go. Augusta, Georgia. Yes, sir. Yeah, if you ever went by the golf course there, it is all fenced in, and you can't even see in in most of those places. So no, you cannot. It is very beautiful, though. Yeah, if you're able to see it, my wife and I pulled up to the front gate, looked in, and then of course the people that were at the front gate was like, "Okay, why are you there?" Ah. <laughs> but yeah. You know, it, it's one of those things that, you know, even though that's the Masters there, it's a very beautiful golf course if you're able to see it. But, yeah. Uh, they had the VHF dish on Fort Gordon. If uh, back in the late, I think, uh, 2090s, late 90s, 2000, in that general area, all our SATCOM stuff was out there. Why? Because, I don't know. Politics, who knows. But now they're bringing all that stuff back here, and we're combining it with our course. So that's the reason why we now call it RF transmissions. So with this parabolic subreflector, again, it's a curved dish, almost in line with our parabolic dish. And it's able to reflect that energy in the transmit side of the house off of that curved dish back into the parabolic side and then out. Makes it into a big cone. Now with the Cutler, however, this one is a little bit hard to explain. They call it a double shot. Actually, if you think about it, even the Cassegrainian is a double shot. They say it has two metal uh, reflectors on the end and they consider this one the narrowest beam width and the highest gain. Well that's very true so I'm going to try to give you that picture and use my hands for part of it but when they say two metal reflectors first of all the waveguide is about this long okay uh. Sound of freedom, I guess. I don't know what kind of jet just went by. That's ridiculous. But anyway, the waveguide's about this big. This is uh, for the one-foot dish on a tisser. So, if 
you can imagine from about here to here is the waveguide. On the tip of the waveguide is two flat reflectors, one on this side and on the other side. Right under here, on both sides, there is a rectangle. It's very small, but you literally got to look up, see it, in order to openings, and that's where your transmit and receive go in and out of. And again, those flat metal reflectors, if your transmit is going to come through the waveguide, come out the hole, that metal reflector is going to bounce it onto the parabolic dish and then out and, and receive, it's going to do the reverse. It's pretty unique. When you get into the Tisser lab, when you put the one foot dish on and you put the one the waveguide that goes with the one foot uh, dish, the end of it, most of our Tissers have the what I call the ping pong ball that's been ripped off of it, and you'll be able to see that. No, you're going, well, why did they rip the ping pong ball off it? Well, it's just one of those things, it's very fragile. If you were to take a look at the two-foot dish waveguide, it's pretty long. It's about, I'd say, about a foot and a half. And on it, you'll see a green ping-pong ball, ping ball-like substance on it. And that's to protect when you're out in the elements, you know, like rain or like the dew in the morning. Or if you're put under, you know, if you have it under a tree, sometimes that uh, the water off a tree will come down on it. So the, you know, the reason why those ping pong balls are so fragile is they have a ping pong ball, you know, into them. And if you've ever played ping pong, <laughs> you know, you hit one of those ping pong balls really hard, they'll smash. So that's the reason why they're off of the small ones versus the, the larger ones. Why? Because we use the daylights out of them. So we've looked at tropospheric communication, antenna terms, and tropospheric antennas. Any questions? All right. So let's. All right. Aaron Bridges, question for you. What? is the area called that when we use tropo, what is the area called that gets refracted back down to Earth? There's two names for it. So what's the area? Yeah, what's the area that we called when it gets refracted back down to Earth? In other words, I shoot it up to the tropo and then it gets refracted back down to the, di uh, the distant end. That area where it gets refracted, what's it called? We gave it two names. Anybody? Scatter volume. Scatter volume or? Common volume. Common volume. I guess. Right. Yeah, well, you know, we all learn. Next up, let's go and pull up our electronic C's and D's. You will utilize the handout 3 Delta 1 3 3 dash 7. Dash seven bra uh, dash nine Bravo, better known as a tropo or the jerk two thirty nine tropospheric satellite support radio. I'll wait till everybody pulls it up. Yeah, sir. Okay, I'm hoping everybody else does. Now I'm going to show you some places in here that is what I call highlights 
that you need to pay attention to. All right, so the first place I'm going to is a page 1 1, chapter 1, paragraph 1.3.1. You'll notice that I have a bunch of it highlighted. Let me try to explain this to you. Types of traffic, better known as baseband, mission traffic, aggregate, our uh, mission bit stream, I've heard. So that's what the traffic is. There's others in there too and I'll point that out so if you read the first sentence in addition radio set blah 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 can carry digital traffic it says a three volt peak to peak condition die phase waveform that is CDI where have you heard that from hmm you'll notice demultiplexing. Yeah, well multiplexing and demultiplexing yes on the NSM and in our signaling formats that we went over in one uh, Bravo. So we look at underneath of it, it says ranging from 0 0.072, better known as 772 megabits per second, uh, excuse me, kilobits per second, up to 4.608 megabits per second. So it's either 0.072 to 4.608 megabits per second, or you can say 72 kilobits per second up to 4.608 megabits per second. You'll notice the next part of that sentence is this analog voice order wire or digital voice order wire. That's in adjacent with the mission bit stream or the aggregate. So that is our channel. It piggybacks onto the aggregate. There's also another one that we use, which is the next following sentence down. It is the radio set uh, jerk 239, blah, 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 can carry 6.144 megabits per second pseudo NRZ. Let me explain that pseudo name to you. Pseudo, this is the only place that you will see that word throughout the rest of the tech order. It's assuming that you read chapter one, and that any time that you see NRZ, it will say pseudo. So if it says NRZ, remember it's pseudo NRZ. What does it mean? It's kind of like NRZ. This is a manufactured product. I do not know why they put pseudo NRZ in there. I can't answer that question. But why in the world wouldn't it be throughout the rest of the tech order? Well, remember this tech manual or tech order was developed back in the early 90s, if not late 80s. And when you print out a bunch of tech orders. Just by one word, you could probably save a page or two. What does that mean? It means the bottom line for the companies saving them thousands of dollars instead of having to print all of that out. Now let's fast forward to, that, to today. Well, most of our tech orders and tech manuals are now on CDs. So if you wanted it updated or they updated it, it's a digital download. That's it. So the, the differences uh, from back then to differences now, again, this is one of those things that is a caveat to the ETO. You can see that when I come down here to 1.3.2, typical deployments, Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. You can put it on a mast, better known as a CTM-15, or a tripod. 
or a rigid telephone pole. That's what they like to say. The idea here is if it's rigid, we can put the dishes on it with the RF assembly, and we'll get into that a little bit later. We go to 1.3.3. These are radio accessories, but they are included when we look at the 150 foot of supplied cable. And there's some others. The bottom portion that I have highlighted says that the RF energy is either one or two foot diameter antenna. When they say that, they're talking about the one or two foot parabolic dish, not the antenna. The antenna is actually in the RF assembly. So they say that with this, you can do vertical and horizontal polarization. Let's continue on. They do have diagrams of the CTM, better known as the mass for us. There is some equipment configurations you'll notice in 1.4 in number 2, number 3, and number 4. There is a difference here. You will see that in number two, it says when deployed with the one foot diameter antenna attached to the RF assembly atop a 50 foot mast. That's at CTM. Number three says when it's deployed with the one or two foot antenna attached to the RF assembly atop a tripod. Hmm. Number four says when deployed with the one and two foot antenna attached to the RF assembly on a pole mount. Wait a minute. Why did it say two foot antenna with the mast? There's a reason why. When you install a two foot parabolic dish, it acts like a sail. It's bad enough with the one foot dish. But when you put a two-foot dish under, there's more area that the wind can blow, and it negates the 70 miles an hour loading that the mass can handle. And you're going, wait a minute, the CTM said 20 miles an hour. Well, that's true. But there's extra guy ropes and longer stakes to make the mast more secure. But just remember, only the one foot parabolic dish can be mounted on top the CTM-15 mast. Remember that. And there's other places in it. Now, all of the transit cases that you will see, and there's three of them, transit cases, that means you have to pick it up and move it. All of them are a two-person lift. Do not get caught trying to lift it by yourself, especially this one. Uh, this one weighs a lot, and I've seen young airmen who will try to pick it up, and they'll pull their back out, and that's after the fact. We've already told them, don't do that. Always two-person lift. Now, you can see in the legend it says number one and number two is the RF assembly and baseband assembly. We're going to talk about that in great length on Monday morning. But in this case contains those two and it's a metal case. It's the only one that's metal. And that's so you don't beat the crap out of it but you know stuff happens. And it comes with other items with it, with those two assemblies. You can see that we got a handset, a headset, a power cord, and our jumper cable. It's a two-foot jumper cable. Well, wait a minute. What about the 150-foot? Oh, it's coming. Give us time. This is what the case looks like from the side. And, of course, this is the antenna case. The... <coughs> excuse me. The one that it says number one, this is the two foot dish. It's normally attached to the lid and down on the bottom you will see the wave guides, number two and number three, and number four is the one foot dish. Number five and number six are 
your guy ropes and stakes. By the way, the mast itself does come in a small carrying bag. I don't know why, because there's a handle on it as far as the mast is concerned. Now, also inside the antenna case, you will see that there's a little adjustment called number six on this picture. They call that an antenna tilt assembly. This goes on top of the mast. Remember when you put the AT197, you put it in, you twisted it a little bit, and then it went down further, and you locked it into place? That's what this one does. The difference is, is the RF assembly is going to fit on top of it. You're going to put a halyard with that tilt assembly. That way you can go up or down, left or right. Kind of amazing how they make these things. And then, of course, there is the tripod mounting plate and pan head tilt assembly case. So those are your three cases. And here's your you know, breakout of your mast and how it's going to look. You'll notice at the top. It says uh, one foot antenna, RF assembly. Number three is your antenna tilt assembly. And number four is the Halyard cable. I want to point down to the bottom right next to the case where the RF assembly and baseband is. Realistically, the RF assembly is already on top of the mast. Number 11. This is one of the reasons why you have a 150 foot cable with it. So if you're going to put it on the mast, a 150 foot cable goes with it. There it is on the tripod. You can see right above me where the 338 is, there's the tisser. It has two assemblies, a baseband and an RF assembly. The RF assembly has the, the parabolic dish with the waveguide on it. When uh, we get into the RF assembly, you'll notice that we have receiver frequencies and transmit frequencies. And I'm going to point this out to you, especially on Monday morning, how we have problems with the students breaking the thumb wheels. Luckily, this is at its end of the life cycle because we can no longer order thumb wheels. Don't break them any more than we have to. Maintenance has done a wonderful job in getting these back up and operational. What they do is they lock the numbers in. When I say lock the numbers in, you'll notice that the frequency range is from 14.4 to 15.25 gigahertz. On this front panel, you'll notice that the 1 is embossed on both the transmit and receive. It doesn't move. Remember the 14 to 15 gigahertz? The other number is where they had to lock down because a lot of our young airmen would see, oh, there's a 4 in here or a 5. That's supposed to be a 1. And then they'll break it. So they either have it locked on a 4 or they have it locked on a 5. I think most of them are locked on the 4s. So all you get is the last three digits to manipulate. With the receive frequency and the transmit frequency, when you get the cut sheet, most of you will see the transmit frequency first. Well, take a look at the front panel here. You'll notice that the receive frequency is on top and the transmit frequency is on the bottom. You do not know how many times that when people can't make calm, I come over and I look at it and they have the frequencies reversed. Also, when it says enter the frequencies in, there's another place everybody forgets, and it's the bottom right hand, bottom left hand side, where it says receiver frequency. This is an old cat's eye tuning for our filter. It's a pre-selector filter. If you do not have both frequency, the BCD, which is the encoder, the receive 
thumb wheels, if that doesn't match the receiver frequency on the bottom left hand side and vice versa, uh, when you get ready to fire this thing up and put it in operate, which is transmit, you're probably not going to be able to talk to anybody. Why? Because your filter is blocking everything. We'll go over it on Monday too. This is your baseband assembly. There's a lot to it. We're going to, when we do signal flow, I'll try to point out as much of this on the front panel as possible. And this part right here, the 1.5.2, it shows you the wind speed of 70 miles an hour. So look what it did from the CTM version versus the 239 version. 20 to 70 miles an hour all because of you have extra guy ropes and you have longer stakes and showing your tripod now whenever we talk basic information about these pieces of equipment and you have a tech order we have something called leading particulars about the devices what it's going to do is going to tell you hey these are my primary power requirements, this is how much I'm going to consume, these are the dimensions, this is the way. It's when you want to find out the nitty gritty of everything, it's when you come to capabilities and limitations which is 1.7 continuing from page 1-16 to 117. Here is the table. This is where all the information starts coming together. You can see the radio set itself, and that's the combination of the baseband assembly and the RF assembly. You can see the frequency range, the output power, the noise level, all of that. When you get down, you start breaking it out a little bit more, like the RF assembly. Again, that's where you see frequency range and the output level. Oh, gee, now we start seeing an IF. By the way, that's a receive IF. Then you look at the baseband, of course there's more information on it, and look at that, we have antennas. So I'm going to point something out to you, and hopefully you can see the differences. One foot antenna has 31 dB. What does that mean? It means that when I combine the RF assembly with the dish, that's approximately 6 dB of gain. Look at it. Subtract 25 from 31, you get 6. Look at the 2 foot antenna, it's 37. 25 from 37, that's 12 dB of gain. That's a lot of gain when you put that 2 foot on there. Let's look at the nominal distances. Maximum says, and that's a less than sign, 10 miles. Well, why in the world would we put a less than sign? Because realistically, it's 16 kilometers it's less than 10 miles. They, they made it with kilometers in mind because it's, from what I understand, the company is from the UK. So they deal in the metric system. We deal with the USA version or whatever, whatever it's called. I think it's called an Imperial? I can't remember. Anyway, less than 10 miles. If you look at the two foot antenna, it says less than 25 miles, which is basically 40 kilometers. 40 kilometers is less than 25 miles. So if I ask you what is the max distance on a one foot antenna, you're either going to say 16 kilometers or less than 10 miles. But if you only have an answer that says 10 miles, less than 10 miles, more than 10 miles, which one are you going to choose? You should choose the, you should go to the tech order and look it up. You're going to see the less than sign. Here is another place where you can see equipment supplied. There's a two footing ca uh, cable, the handset, the headset, power cord. I was just highlighting some gee whiz stuff here. You can see that we have the cable reel assembly. Let me mark that. While I'm remembering it. Cable reel assembly, which is your 150 foot, it also comes with it. Let's see here. I think in chapter two is the next place we look at. Yep, 
Chapter 2, Contents of the Transit Case. Here's installation procedures. You'll see that the man hours, there's a tripod is one man hour. That's one of you. To set it up, go through all the checks, and to make calm. We're going to require a two-person setup. You're going to have 45 minutes to set it up for the first couple times, and then it goes to a half an hour. The idea is we're trying to get you into the speed area where we get the comm up and operational. When you get to block 10, it's going to be one person per tisser, but you're already going to have everything checked out, made sure that the equipment works, you're on frequency, so the only thing you have to do is set it up. Set it up, apply power, bam, make comm, you're good, 15 minutes. That is the requirement. And of course, you can see where a mast is four man hours. Pole is a lot longer because you got to coordinate putting the pole in and getting the cherry picker to put it on the pole and so forth and so on. And this is some information about how you put the mast up. Pretty much the same information from the CTM, except with extra guy ropes. Chapter four is yeah, two foot or one foot. Again, which one's this one? Uh, this is figure two dash fifteen. Again, it's saying about the two and the one foot dish. Excuse me. Ah, uh, yeah. Remember, I told you about the transmitter, thumbwheel switches, and that. When you get into operation, because you, this is basically what it's going to tell you. We did a extract from the operation, and that's what you're going to be using. You can see it says, when it says rotate the four transmitter frequency thumb wheel switches to the desired frequency as well as the transmit, which is uh, the next one. But I want to go to 4-1, table, 4-1, page, 4-3. You will see a more detailed explanation about those thumb wheels. Talking about the one is embossed, you can only do the, uh, the second one from the left, which is the first thumb wheel, that can only be a four or a five, and then of course, goes through everything else. You'll see that we have a channel air light and a summary alarm on that front panel. When we get to the baseband assembly, this is getting a little bit crazy, but you know it goes through a whole boatload of lights, switches, and meter readings. And this is your baseband assembly. And then, of course, the operation, which is going to be on the cut sheet. Then we get to theory of operation. This is what we're going to be going through on Monday. We're going to be looking at the transmit operation first. Then we're going to look at the receiver operation. It's going to take very little time to go through the order wire and loop back. But the bulk of the information is on the transmitter and receiver. First part of that is the transmit section. This is the electronic C's and D's that you will see. Suggest that if you can highlight them, do so and put notes on them or print them out and do it that way. This is the receiver operation. Again, I think that one, let's see, on transmit operation, we start with the baseband assembly on page four, RF assembly is on page five. Receiver operation is on pages 6 for the RF assembly and page 7 for the baseband assembly. And then with order wire and loopback testing, we just use one or the other because it's very brief. But you can, they do have the breakout of that if you want to use it. Any questions on the tech order? Uh, sir? Yeah. Uh, for the first table we saw, I think it was table 1-1 or 1-2 about the capabilities and limitations. 
to get there. Would you say that table is very important? That it's uh, What's it's something to really get familiarize yourself with. I'm trying to get to table one dash. You mean uh, table one dash one or table one dash two? One with the RF assembly, the one dash two. Okay, one dash two is where all your basic information is. I mean, you can glean it from chapter one, but it's really difficult to find. By coming to a table, it's so much easier, especially about trying to find out about the antennas right down here. I cannot confirm nor deny because that would be, you know, beyond that. Yes, I, could, I could tell you one dash chapter one is a very important scenario along with chapter four's table because we're going to quickly go over it on four I think it's no five alpha because five alpha basically I just did five alpha the difference is is they have the uh, slideshow versus this I take you through the tech order show you the highlighted areas where to focus. What is it? Knowing where it's at versus trying to find it. That's the key part. Mr. Mayor. Sir. Are you going to record this uh, Discord as well and throw it on YouTube or in the resources? Well, this part, yes. The This morning session uh I made a boo boo. I got the first half hour recorded, put it on pause. When we came back, I forgot to unpause it. Then we went on a quick break, came back and realized, oh crap, I had it on pause for a half an hour an hour. There are some caveats. So it you know, I'm gonna do both of those. Because we miss part of that, I would suggest that you go when you know when you get to that link, go to one of the other ones like uh, 22 and 28. You know, classes 22 and 28 in that area. It'll tell you what uh, you know down below the description on our YouTube channel. It'll tell you the description of what's in that particular video. So that's one way to look at it because I'm pretty sure I really screwed that one up. Oh boy. All right, no worries. Thank you. And, and I can, if you want me to, I'll put a link of one of the better ones for the screw up that I had for this morning. Any other questions? And by the way, does that help? You know, going back and reviewing what we just spoke about by going on YouTube and looking at it. It helps me. Uh, it helps me personally, yeah. Okay. Yes, sir, Good. Sometimes I wonder if, uh, you know, when I go to YouTube, when I'm uploading, there are some that never had a view and I'm going, okay, am I doing this, you know, because... I think you're going to look at it or, you know, you know what I'm saying. Sometimes I wonder. I mean, like, I just, sometimes I'll just fast forward to the block that, like, I'm having trouble with. So maybe yeah. you won't show the full view. That's probably why the view times are a little bit lower. Well, I can see if you view it, it can also dictate how much time was in there. And that's what I encourage. Okay, I got to come to this section. I got to fast forward to the place I don't have a problem with that. I would rather you guys use it for what it's supposed to be set up for, not, you know, I make it, put it on YouTube, and no one looks at it. That's, you know, that's a little, some work there that just went unseen. So anyway, yeah, I'll, I'll post it. I'll go through what I think is uh, a couple good ones and then, Post the links down here in the chat. All right. And that's, I appreciate that. 
Because that's I'm look through it in the, on the weekend for sure. Okay. Well, that's only for this morning. This afternoon, I, I hit the record button, so we're good on that one. All right. Is there any other questions? Remember, I'm on Discord a lot. You can ask a question. Uh, you know, once I, after the six o'clock, it may take me a little bit of time to get to you because when I play tanks or 15 minute games, you know what I'm saying. Is it may be a like a half an hour, 45 minutes could be a, you know, couple hours if I'm not really looking. All right. Well, we will see you on Monday at nine o'clock. Again, we're going to do the nine o'clock and one o'clock. The 9 o'clock will most likely be finishing up through signal flow. The 1 o'clock will be homework. So if you hadn't been working through homework, I suggest that you at least get all the way up to 4 Bravo. So that way you have some time to do uh, 4 Charlie and 5 Alpha. I could tell you that 5 Alpha is a lot easier to do than 4 Charlie. So if you already got it completed, great. I know Airman Zeller sent his yesterday. Good job. So be on time, be there, be square, and have a fantastic weekend. Stay safe. Okay? Thank you, sir. All right. We'll see you later.